Hey there guys, and welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogue John, aka The Seattle Data Gap. Today we're going to talk about what is the difference between machine learning and data engineering pipelines. Now, if you're like me, you probably spent uh, the bulk of your career assuming that machine learning pipelines are drastically different than data engineering pipelines. In fact, I recall when I built my first model, uh, I was very confused in terms of what do I do with this? Because I was like, how do I actually deploy this into production? And clearly I'm not the only person who has this question because I put out an article with the help of Sarah Flores, who wrote all of it. Um, I only added a few images uh, to answer this question and to try to give a baseline framework to understand the difference between a data engineering versus machine learning pipeline. So let's dive into those differences. So there are many reasons why I think there's at least a little confusion uh, around machine learning versus data engineering pipelines. One of those being that a lot of machine learning pipelines use Airflow. I remember when I first heard that or realized that I was like, oh, I mean, so what's the difference between ML um, and data engineering pipelines, you know, in terms of like how they function. And also recently I saw an article put out by Costas where he also kind of said, you know, machine learning pipelines are very similar to data engineering pipelines. So I think there's a lot that, yeah, you can kind of feel like they are the same. They have some steps that need to take place often involving data that needs to be processed, um, sometimes using SQL, sometimes using Python, and then sometimes there's some level of storage of their results, and so suddenly you're like, this is kind of the same thing. So let's try to make this clearer. First, let's dive into data engineering pipelines. And if you're accustomed to these pipelines, you might be thinking some of like data engineering workflows or data pipelines, you know, there's, there's a lot of different terms you can use. Um, it's kind of an umbrella term, right? Like there's like ETL, there's CDC, um, there's like real time types of pipelines. So there's all forms of ways to take data from a source and put it into some sort of like data warehouse layer. But as Sarah pointed out in the article, there's a couple key classifications of steps that needs to occur. Uh, the first generally being data collection. Um, often you're using some sort of data connector um, to pull this, or maybe you're coding your own. This is either from something like an API, an SFTP, some form of source. You pull said data, um, often from there, you'll do some level of data cleaning um, to standardize all that data. This is often sometimes re referenced as the little t, you know, you're cleaning it, maybe doing some light standardizing. Um, then maybe some other layer of transform as well. Uh, this could be, you know, adding business logic, uh, maybe integrating data. She used data integration as one of the steps. Um, so something like a T uh, and then also some form of loading it into a data storage system. Now, this is again, more traditional ELT, ETL, Honestly, I've seen too many different mixes of the two where one's like E, T, T, L, T. So the point being whichever one you're using, those are some methods of getting data from a uh, raw data source to an end kind of core table. Obviously in between that, there's things like data modeling that needs to occur um, as well as other checks, but that's kind of the baseline. And in terms of tools that you can use to do this, you might be using something like Airflow. Um, yes, it's for workflow orchestration, but a lot of people use it for data pipelines. You might use something that is more low code like SSIS. You might even do something like use cron and Python and stored procedures and some mix in that regard. But most of the time you're playing with Python, SQL, maybe some low code solutions. And the end goal is really what tends to differentiate things here. The end goal um, here being that you're trying to create some sort of core data models that data analysts, data scientists, and machine learning engineers can use. Now, in theory, most of these data pipelines should be a straight line from point A to point B. But I've seen plenty of spaghetti pipelines. Um, you know, Sarah said that they should be straight lines, but I've just seen so many spaghetti pipelines in my day where somehow you go from source to, you know, core table back to source again, um, that they do exist. So in theory, they should be straight lines, but that's not always the case. Now we can compare that to machine learning pipelines. They will also generally have some sort of data cleaning step because maybe they're taking data from a data lake. Maybe they're taking it from, you know, a data warehouse, but they might be doing some further processing to make sure that that data is exactly the data they need. They have things like unbalanced data set problems and other issues that they might have to further process the data to make sure it's exactly what they need. They also have steps like feature engineering, uh, model registries, model training, model uh, monitoring, um, and model deployment, and that's kind of out of order, so I'm going to put it in a more correct order here. The point being that each of these steps adds more nuance to the actual model deployment. For example, feature engineering in particular can kind of feel similar 
to that of your general transform. Um, in fact, again, that was one of the points that Costas brought out in his recent article. I'll uh, we'll put a picture up here that this is a lot of very familiar data engineering terminology. But generally, this is, I think, more focused towards the ML route, um, where feature engineering is more about selecting the right features to actually develop these models. So what features actually should be weighted towards this model? There's a lot of extra steps here that go into picking the correct features. Yes, there's a lot of solutions that can do that for you, but there's a lot of levels here in terms of what you know feature engineering is, what a feature store is. There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes in there that's more than just doing a basic transform. But after that, yeah, it kind of creates this sometimes table when I talk to a lot of um, MLOps engineers. There'll just be some level of table or um, S3 uh, type of table that versions the different data sets. And then you can pull those features in the future. From there, you've got some level of model training. Um, so this is the actual training, obviously, of the model that's going to then be deployed later. Um, in this case, it can really depend on how you deploy the model. So similar to the way that you can think that data engineering pipelines have like a real time and a batch component, machine learning can also feel like it has a real time and a batch component. The difference here is generally the real time version of this pipeline isn't really real time. It's more of online inference. So the model is running in real time, but the actual model was likely still trained um, on a batch process. If you read the article that was written by Ian um, in my newsletter, where he talked about how League of Legends deploys their models. One of the things that he talks about is how they kind of pull data from the game, um, then they run their models, and then they deploy them to actually do the online inference. So they've already run the models in the past, but they're just using those models and you know their current features and things of that nature. So they're actually using it to calculate real-time results. Whereas you still have batched results that can occur, for example, something like a lead score, or possibly something far more complex than that, where Maybe you just need this value that's refreshed every three to four days or maybe every day. It doesn't need to be live in terms of like what it's calculating. You already know what the number is. You just need to pull that value um, via some sort of service. Um, and that's really all you're doing. It's more similar to that of a data engineering kind of, you know, pulling a metric um, result versus trying to recalculate um, what your real time value should be. So these are kind of some differentiators here. And I also reference a few other components here, like model registry um, and model uh, monitoring. And these are really important because as you develop more and more models, it kind of becomes similar to that of an API service, where you'll generally have some sort of service layer that can then go back um, into your model registry, pick the correct model, make sure it's using the correct parameters to actually serve whatever the result is. So this is, again, to me, something that's slightly different than our traditional data engineering pipelines, where most of the time we're generally just pulling data for some sort of dashboard or maybe just creating a core data set that analysts and other people will use. Here, these results are being uh, produced real time or again, some sort of batch result that's just being fed into often a customer's uh, interface, right? It's, it's somehow being used in the customer experience to give them the correct feed or to give them the correct opponents to play if they're playing League of Legends or something similar to that. And finally, there's model monitoring, which yes, data engineering pipelines should also have monitoring, but I feel like model monitoring is a little different because what you're trying to detect if the model acting in some way that's drastically different than expected. You know, you've already deployed this model. In theory, it was tested correctly on the previous data sets that you trained it on. But as you train it with new data sets, you might have it do some unexpected things. And that's what you're generally trying to avoid. Like if you're used to spending a thousand dollars on ads and then suddenly the model says you should spend a million dollars, that might be a problem and you should have some logic that stops it. But if you don't, you're about to spend a million dollars without meaning to because your model is now acting slightly differently because maybe some data that was fed was either bad or maybe it just had a drastic change where now the output is not acting as expected. So a lot of monitoring is to make sure that the model continues to operate in some level of bounds that you are expecting it to work in. So those are the general component differences. I think another difference that I would notice when I worked at Facebook was the, the difference in compute. When data engineers ran their pipelines, you know, it never was that crazy. No one was blowing up pipelines. We had quotas that were set. I mean, they were kind of soft quotas, just generally predicting how much you're using currently and kind of like, you know, assuming you're going to slightly grow over time. 
And every once in a while, we'd get an alert saying, hey, you're like three times over quota. And that's generally what would make it explode in terms of compute. It wasn't just necessarily the amount of data, but also what they were trying to do in terms of processing. And I mean, some of those pipelines would be 10, 12 DAGs deep, um, each of those being individual DAGs that would then have, you know, further steps inside, you know, another 10 steps inside. So we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of steps um, running various computations just to get to some final number or result. So oftentimes when it came to compute, they were just using a massive amount more um, in terms of what they were trying to do and what they were trying to process. Whereas honestly, most of our pipelines were pretty standard SQL for the most part, occasionally having to parse um, some API results or something similar to that, but nothing that was beyond uh, reason or that would yell at us <laughs> because we were using so much compute. So those are kind of some of the differences between machine learning and data engineering pipelines. There's a lot of similarities, right? Like there's some processing that occurs in both, but what type of processing that occurs in both is different. One is generally more SQL heavy and more focused on creating core data models. And the other is often Python code or some sort of mathematical code that then processes all this data that is generally used for the customer experience to be improved. So they're a little closer often to the customer. That's why you'll often see things like recommender systems be referenced because it's just such an easy example of how you can use ML in your product because that's generally where the data ends up. Now, of course, the next question is which one of these kinds of roles is more likely for you? And I imagine you'll figure that out over time. If you've just started on your journey, I wouldn't get too stuck on one or the other. I'd make sure you have the experience required for the one that you think you like at the moment, but you'll eventually figure out which role you like. I've seen a lot of people go from data engineer to ML ops engineer um, or data scientist to ML ops engineer just based on the fact that they had the right skill set. If you're trying to figure out what's the right role, I wouldn't get too stuck on it. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate all your time and I will see you next time. Thanks and goodbye.